And with that refrain as our prayer, we turn to the word of Christ together. If you would take your copy of God's word and turn with me to the book of Colossians. We'll begin Colossians chapter 2 this morning. If you don't have a Bible with you, you're welcome to use one of the black hardback Bibles you'll find in the seat in front of you. You'll find Colossians 2 on page 983, 983 of that Bible in the seat in front of you. We'll begin Colossians chapter 2 and look at verses 1 to 5, but we are really, even though there's a chapter break here, we're just continuing the same thought that began in chapter 1, verse 24. So I actually want to read this morning there, starting there, and read through verse 5 of chapter 2. So we'll begin our reading in Colossians 1, verse 24. Colossians 1, 24, it is written, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that powerfully works within me. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this, in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Our God, we do pray that if nothing of our efforts lasts beyond our life or any legacy is seen that would give credit to our name, we pray that glory would be to your Son, that as we live, He would be honored in our lives. Father, we pray that even as that has been the testimony and even the validation of your great Apostle Paul, for him to live was Christ and his death was gain itself to be with him. Everything in life is organized by you for your children that we would know you in Christ and that we would grow in him. And we pray that that would be the fruit of even our time together this morning. Help us hear your word. We pray the spirit of your son would illuminate our hearts and ears and eyes to see him in his word. And Father, we pray that you would, by your Spirit, help the one who explains your word to expose what you intend for the good of your church and to apply and edify her to grow in your Son. We ask this, Father, that Christ is honored and that you are glorified in your church. And we come to you in Jesus' name. Amen. The Red Letter Bible is only about 100 years old. Louis Klotsch, editor of a Christian magazine, wanted more people to read the Bible and to understand the Bible's main point, Jesus Christ. So in 1901, he printed the very first red letter New Testament where Jesus' direct speech in the Gospels is printed in red. In the preface, Klopsch said this, that his purpose was to gather from Jesus' own lips the definition of his mission to the world and his own revelation of the Father. Now, of course, red-letter Bibles now are taken for granted. In fact, to get a black-letter text is a special request you have to make to Bible publishers. And however well-intended, and certainly he was well-intended, our brother Louis Klopsch, we must conclude that his idea for a red-letter Bible was a massive lapse of judgment. 
now Bible readers assume that the words Jesus directly spoke are somehow more inspired or more authoritative than the other letters and words of God's word. But we're told that all scripture is breathed out by the mouth of God and the Holy Spirit carried along the writing of every letter in his word, those in black or in red. Also, the tragic irony is, is that the red lettering of Jesus' direct speech has actually contributed to misunderstanding his own words and his own mission. Often, Bible readers have the impression that Jesus' words in red stand alone, and they can be read sort of out of their context and apart from themselves as just separate sayings. But when it's the black letters that give the red letters any meaning at all, and when they were said and what Jesus was communicating. But perhaps most of all, the red letter subtly ignores how Jesus himself designed that we know him, that we know what it means to live in him, what's consistent with him, and what's not. That we receive Christ through the witness of his apostles. On the night he was betrayed, the Lord promised his disciples in John 16, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, he will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Now, this is often misunderstood as a promise to every Christian that the Holy Spirit will give them all truth, which is not true at all. That's not a promise to every Christian. That's a promise Jesus spoke to his disciples that would become his apostles, that they would receive all the truth of Christ, and that as his witnesses, they can then declare that truth to others. And that's the last commission the Lord Jesus gave his disciples before he ascended into heaven. In Acts chapter 1, he promised them, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. In other words, when the Spirit of truth comes and brings you into all the truth, he takes all that is mine and gives it to you, then you will proclaim me, and you will witness of me to the very ends of the earth. And after the last apostle, the apostle Paul, met Jesus on the road to Damascus, Jesus gave him the same commission. Specifically, in Acts chapter 9, he said, Paul would be a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. The Lord Jesus planned that we would know him, that we would know who he is as God the Son come in the flesh, that we would know his work as living and dying on the cross and rising to be the savior of sinners, that we would know him and that he would become known through his apostles, through the word that he gave to them by his spirit. And that's precisely what Paul is explaining to the Colossians here. He's explaining how to receive this letter. Already in chapter 1, we saw in verses 15 to 23, Paul declare the absolute truth about Christ. He is the complete sovereign, the only Lord over existence, and he's the only Savior that sinners may have from God. That's the gospel, Paul says, at the end, end of verse 23 of chapter 1, of which he became a minister. And then last week, we looked at verses 24 through 29, where Paul explained his role in revealing that gospel that he suffered to complete Christ's afflictions for the sake of the church. He suffered, verse 27, that the Gentiles, the nations, the ends of the earth would know the hope of Christ in them, of being brought into God himself by faith in Jesus Christ. That's why he says in verse 28, we proclaim him, we proclaim Christ. And verse 29, toil that this takes place. But Paul, as we see in verse 1 of chapter 2, hasn't been seen by the Colossians. And he's definitely not coming anytime soon. He's being taken care of the Roman government. He's imprisoned in Rome. And how are the Colossians to know Christ when his witness is not there? How are they to know him when the apostle is absent? Well, Paul says in verse 5 that he might be physically absent but he's spiritually present. He's come in his apostolic authority in Christ in this letter. And the reason Colossae should receive this letter and especially receive the instructions and commands and the warnings that are about to start in verse 6, 
They should receive them as Christ's witness to them from Christ's apostle. And he makes very clear in the center of this passage at the end of verse 2, he's writing and ministering that they know Christ. Klopsch was right. The Lord wants us to hear the definition of Christ's mission to the world and his own revelation of himself. And that's why he sent us his apostles. That's why he's given us his word. Like this book here from the Apostle Paul. That we would know him. That we would know who he is from himself. From his own witnesses. And we see in this passage that our Lord has revealed himself to us through his apostles. So that we receive their word as his word. That we might know him. We receive the apostolic word that we might know the Christ who sent his apostles. Even this epistle is written in red. It's coming to us from Christ that we might know Christ. Well, I want to ask and answer from this passage, how do we then receive the apostles' word? And we'll see in verse 1, we receive it as authenticated by their suffering. Authenticated by their suffering. We receive it in verses 2 and 3 as intended for our growth. Intended for our growth in Christ. And in verses 4 and 5, we receive the apostle's word as required for our discernment. It's required that we might be discerning. Let's look first at verse 1. We receive the apostle's word as authenticated by their suffering. It's validated or proven by the apostle's suffering. Paul says in verse 1, he hadn't seen the Colossians, but they knew him already through his fellow servant, Epaphras. And if you remember back into chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, Epaphras was the one who evangelized and discipled and what we would say planted the church in Colossae. But before Paul warns and teaches them further, beginning in verse 6, they need to know more of the intensity of his struggle for you. Not only them, but also the church at Laodicea, who is also to read this letter. And even all, Paul says in verse 1, who have not seen me face to face. Paul says, I want you to know that my struggle is for all Christians, even those who've had no direct involvement with me, and who haven't seen me, and in whose presence I haven't been. How is that then? What kind of struggle can Paul have for Christians he doesn't even know? Well, he's personalizing here the thought of verse 29. Notice that he's repeating that same word in verse 29 of chapter 1. For this I toil, struggling. He struggles with God's energy to proclaim Christ, to reveal Christ, to preach the gospel, to reveal God's secret, God's mystery, the hope of Christ in you for all who trust him. We get even more insight into Paul's struggle at the end of this book into chapter 4. In verse 3, Paul asks the Colossians that you would pray for a door for the word, that he would declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison. You see, proclaiming the gospel for Paul, Paul's mission to proclaim Christ, included suffering imprisonment, including tortures, included beatings and sufferings. The struggle to preach the gospel and to reveal the truth of Christ was an immense struggle that required intense suffering. This is what Paul would later tell Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 10 and 12. He says, The gospel for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. Because I'm an apostle, I suffer. It's required. It's in the job description to make Christ known. The struggle is necessary. Paul suffered for the gospel. Christians need to know the gospel revealed by Paul came through suffering. It came through struggling. They need to know that because that's what testifies the gospel is true. That's what validates the witness that Paul and the other apostles give to their testimony of Christ. The truth of the gospel was known because Paul suffered for the sake of the church. And that even validated and authenticated that message. And you see that throughout the New Testament. Whenever the apostle Paul has to authenticate himself as an apostle, 
pull out his apostolic credentials, show his ID card as a true witness of Christ? What does he point to? His theological training? Nope. His depth of knowledge? Nope. His spiritual power and experiences? Nope. In fact, several times he tells us I don't want to even talk about him. What Paul consistently and repeatedly points to to validate his claim to speak for Christ himself is his suffering, his struggles, how he imitates Christ himself in his own life and ministry. Just a couple of other places this comes up is 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10, where Paul refers to himself at the end of all the apostles and says, I worked harder than all of them. You want to know whether I'm an apostle or not? Look at how I've labored and suffered. Also to the Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3, he wrote this, As servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. We validate ourselves as servants of God, listen, by great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger. You want, to pull out, you want me to pull out my apostolic resume, Paul says? This is what's on it. Imprisonment, beating, suffering, shipwreck, persecution. That proves I speak for Christ. Or perhaps most simply, Paul ends his letter to the Galatians in Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, and says, I bear on my body the marks of Christ Jesus. Let no one cause me trouble. Don't bother me. And don't assault me about it being an apostle. I'll take my shirt off and show you the marks of beatings I've received. And those are my identifiers as an apostle of Christ. Paul's struggle, the reason he wants them to know how great a struggle he has for them, is because it validates his testimony. It proves and authenticates his witness for Jesus, even this letter. And it still functions that way to this day to us. Many throughout the history of criticism of Christianity have tried to dismiss the Apostle Paul as some religious genius who invented Christianity. But that just doesn't square with the facts. What did Paul receive for preaching Christ? He only received loss in worldly terms. He lost his physical comfort. He lost his personal security. He lost normal life expectations like family or finances or a career or being thought well of. What he gained was imprisonment and torture and endless suffering and a life that ended in Rome with his own beheading. And Paul is just one of many apostles to Christ who met Christ after he rose from the grave and before he ascended and who suffered tremendously to tell the world that truth. How else do you explain that? Has there ever been a conspiracy of lies of such a large group of people where they all agreed to lie and lose everything in their lives for it? That's irrational to believe that. It doesn't make any sense. We might see it even clearer when we recognize that every other religious claim in the world, whether Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism, first came on the world and began through violence, violently forced upon people by military oppression. But yet the apostles of Christ shed their own blood to tell the world. The late Senator Patrick Moynihan used to say, everyone's entitled to their own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. And those are the facts and before anyone can dismiss the witness of the apostles and can dismiss the witness of the New Testament, they have to account for those facts. How do you explain Paul recklessly giving his life away? The only logical and rational explanation is that Jesus rose from the grave and commissioned him as his apostle, and what he says about him is true. His suffering authenticates his witness. And so we receive his word as validated by his own suffering. That's why we need to know how great it was. 
Secondly, beginning in verse 2, we receive the apostle's word as intended for our growth intended or purposed for our growth in Christ. Why does Paul suffer so much to minister the gospel and to reveal it to the Colossians and and to others? It's so they're encouraged and united and they grow to know Christ. And that's the main idea of verses 2 and 3. Now, as you can see, verses 2 and 3 is something of a complex sentence. It's pretty typical of Paul. He liked run-on sentences. But there's a clear structure here At the beginning of verse 2, we have Paul's purpose. We might want to translate that, in order that, or for the purpose that, their hearts may be encouraged, and they might be knit together in love. And then in the second part of verse 2, the part which starts to reach all the riches, we might understand as Paul's ultimate result, the ultimate desire that he has from these goals. You might translate that, I, I have great a struggle I have, verse 2, in order that their hearts are encouraged and knit together in love, so that they reach all the riches of full assurance in Christ. Now really, the Christian Standard Bible does a really great job here in verse 2 of clarifying these statements. And they translate it like this, I want their hearts to be encouraged and joined together in love so that they may have all the riches of complete understanding. So Paul here, he has two goals in mind. Be encouraged and be knit together in love. And the ultimate outcome he desires from those two goals is reach complete understanding of Christ. He has two goals with his ultimate desire that by these you grow to know Christ. Well, let's look first in verse 2 at his two goals. I suffer that your hearts may be encouraged. Now, we're likely to read that in our own day because we use the word heart and we use the word encourage, but we primarily use both of those emotionally, especially our fellow citizens in the South that say things like, well, bless their hearts. And so we might think Paul wants to encourage their hearts. He just wants to give them some emotional support, a little pick-me-up. But in Scripture, the heart is not just the center of emotions. It's far bigger than that. It's the center of your personality. In the Bible, your heart thinks, it chooses, it wills, it decides. It's the center of who you are. It's your real self. And the word encourage has the idea of giving strength to or strengthen. To encourage them along is to strengthen them. So we could agree with the writer who suggested we should understand this as, I'm doing this so that their lives may be strengthened that your lives may be strengthened. In other words, Paul's saying, I'm suffering to preach the gospel so that all you are is strengthened to hold to Christ. That you are encouraged in your whole life, as he wrote in verse 23, to continue in the faith, to be stable, to be steadfast, to hold fast to Christ. Without that strength, they might be tempted to look elsewhere, to go other places, to turn away from full commitment to Christ. You've seen the same idea in the book of Hebrews, chapter 3, verse 13, where it reads, we are to encourage one another every day, as long as it's called today, so that no one is hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Strengthen each other every day. Encourage each other so that you hold to Christ and you don't turn away to sin. So he wants to strengthen Christians to decide and to act and to hold fast to Christ. Secondly, he wants to not just strengthen Christians to hold fast to Christ, but to hold fast to one another, being knit together in love, that we should read that as being united in love. Later in chapter 3, Paul will describe love in verse 14 as that perfect bond that binds everything together in harmony. Well, how does preaching the gospel create loving unity in a congregation? Remember verse 27. What he repeats here in verse 2, what is God's mystery? God's secret that's now being revealed, that's been revealed since the coming of Christ. It's Christ in you. That those who trust Christ, whether Jew or Gentile, anyone in the world, regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of their gender, regardless of their status in life, anyone in the world who trusts Christ is at the same status with every other Christian. The wonderful secret that God revealed is there's 
no hierarchy in himself. Or as Paul will say in chapter 3, verse 11, Christ is all and in all. If you belong to Christ, you belong to one another, and you're one in him. There's no elitism in the family of God. The foot of the ground is level at the cross of Christ. What does that create? Well, that creates is a loving unity with one another. No one has more of Christ than any other. No one has greater uh, um, justification or righteousness in Christ than someone else. It's all Christ. It creates a loving unity that might be radically different from the world's standards. It creates a radical unity between people that have nothing in common with one another except Christ. And it creates this knit together in love. They've been made one and they love one another because Christ has loved them all. Paul is describing this encouragement and this unity as why he writes this letter. That's why he suffers. That's why he ministers the gospel, to strengthen them, to hold on to Christ, and to unify them as a church. And remember here, these are just the goals that are really just the conditions for the end of verse 2 to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of which is Christ. In other words, the encouragement and the unity, they're prerequisites to the full knowledge of Christ. Growing in Christ is reserved for those who are strengthened to hold fast to them and for those who are united with his church. That's the clear logic of Paul's sentence here. Growing in Christ the full knowledge of him, grasping more and more of who he is, is reserved for those who are strengthened to hold to him and for those who are united with his church. And I'm guessing as we hear both of those, that second one is more of the surprise for us. I'm guessing that second truth of being united with his church is the one we find most surprising. Because we can tend to think today that we can pursue knowing Christ in isolation alone. We get our books, we get our podcasts, we get our audio sermons, we might sit in the back of a lecture here or there, and then just grow. But growing in Christ is way more than an independent intellectual process. And there is real knowledge of Him that is only attained and is only available when we are in vital relationship to his church. You see, when we are in unity as a church, we see Christ work through us and through one another. And so our knowledge of him as he works in relationship with each other as his body, it grows. When we experience love from other Christians, when we have to trust Christ to deny ourselves to love and serve others, our knowledge of Christ, our conviction about who he is and what he does, it deepens, it grows. When we see others change, and they change in relationship to us, and we watch them progress, when we see our relationships deepen with people that we have nothing in common with except Jesus, and yet we love and serve one another because of Jesus, who do we get to know more and more? Jesus. Our understanding of him and what he's accomplished deepens and expands. When we see Christ in action through his church and in his church, our understanding of him expands. Our conviction of who he is grows and becomes more solid and certain and grows more firm. Friend, this is at the heart of what we mean when we talk about church membership. What God intends by our loving commitment to a congregation, to join ourselves to a church, to a group of Christians that we would serve and be accountable to, this is at the heart of what we're talking about. It's to know Christ. Christ cannot be fully known apart from the brotherly love of his church. He cannot be fully known apart from the brotherly love of where he is active in his spirit in his church. When a professing Christian resists 
fellowship and resist joining participation and commitment with the local church, they're not just neglecting God's people, which they are, they're resisting to know Christ more. They're resisting to grow and know Him and to deepen in their knowledge of Him and all that He is and all that He does through His people. So we hold that out to everyone here and remind ourselves if we have committed ourselves as a congregation, what the ultimate goal is. It's to know Him. It's to see Him. And it's to experience Him more even as as He works and lives through his church. Paul says this is his ultimate desire there in the middle of verse 2. His ultimate desire is in writing for them to be strengthened and for them to be united in love is to reach all the riches of full assurance that God would encourage them and unite them, that the Colossians would come into the riches of a full knowledge of Christ. Now Paul's repetition of ideas here at the end of verse 2 is meant to be emphatic. He's he's repeating himself to just hammer home the main point that our ultimate goal, our ultimate striving, his ultimate desire is that we know God's mystery, which is Christ. And he begins by saying here in verse 2, he wants us to reach, there are riches available. These are not material riches, but there is real value, real wealth. There's real treasure available in Christ. You can't put a price tag on it because it is the full assurance or the complete understanding. In other words, the complete conviction of knowing, of knowing Christ and knowing that you know him. That's what Paul's talking about here. The wealth of being assured that you know Christ, that you understand him in truth, who he is and who he's not. Not only knowing him, but knowing that you know him and you're fully convinced you understand and you fully know the true Christ. And you're able, therefore, to discern what's true about him and what's falsely claimed about him because you know him. And Paul's enticing us and encouraging us. There's riches available for you to not live in doubt, to not live in uncertainty, to not live in immaturity and ignorance, but to know Christ and know that you know him, and be fully assured of your knowledge of him. Remember, Paul's writing for their encouragement and unity, not just so they keep a set of religious ideals, not just so they maintain some ethical principles, but so that they know Christ. This is how Paul described his own Christian life. To the Philippians, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, he said, I account everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of living as a Christian. No. The surpassing worth of having a a moral life in an immoral world. No. Because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. I count everything as lost because of the riches of the full assurance of understanding the knowledge of Christ. The wealth to know Him. The point of every striving. The point of every self-denial the intended outcome for every duty and every obligation for Christians in their life is to know Christ. And Paul sets this out on the front door so that in everything that's coming in this letter, the warnings in chapter 2, the instructions in chapter 3, the point and intent of them all is that you know Christ. You live before Him, you fight sin, you beware of error so that you know Christ. That's the goal. That's always the goal. The ultimate point of all this that we receive is so we know Christ. Him we proclaim. And what is there to be known in Christ? That's what he says in verse 3. What's to be known in Christ? Well, just everything. In Him, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And the emphasis in this sentence is the smallest word, all. In him is everything, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And what he means by hidden is not concealed, as though God has made it very difficult to find. He means stored up or deposited. In Christ, we have stored up, we can find all the riches, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The only way to know God, 
The only way to know God's purposes, the only way to know the truth about the meaning of everything is to know Christ. In Him is the meaning of all things. There's no other person. There's no other philosophy. There's no other religious ideal. There's no other source of knowledge to understand this life or understand the life to come apart from Christ. It's all in Him. He not only in chapter 1 rules all things visible and visible, because He rules all things, He is the source of knowing all things. To understand everything, you must know and understand Christ. Sometimes we have this great temptation to reduce Jesus' role to giving us a spiritual pick-me-up if we want. Or as one pastor has said, we come to God for a band-aid, but he's really interested in performing open-heart surgery. Jesus is the king who is at the center of everything. He is without beginning or end, the creator and sustainer of all things. And he is God's mystery. That is God's secret. The secret that we saw in verse 27 that was hidden for ages and generations, but now has been revealed. What does that mean? That means Jesus is the meaning of history. Everything before him, those ages and generations, it was all moving towards his coming, toward God stepping into humanity, his dying on the cross as a substitutionary atonement, and his rising again to be the Savior of all who trust him. Everything in human history was moving to that moment where Jesus would step onto the scene. And everything to come is moving to his eventual return when history will reach its final conclusion. To know hit the meaning of everything is to know Jesus, to know our lives, to understand our experience rightly, to know human existence and flourishing, to know anything. We must know Christ. To know Christ is to understand and know all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Everything that God has for us to know that He's revealing to us, He's done so through Christ. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, you need to know and understand this is the main thing we're about. This is what we're here for. As it was in Paul's day and it still is today and it will be till Christ returns, many people say many things in the name of Christianity. But you need to know and understand this. Christianity is Christ. It's Him. We have ideals, yes. We have principles, yes. We have some philosophies, yes. But all of those, the whole point of all of them is outworking the knowledge of Christ. The main thing we're about, why we're here, is Christ. A person, our risen Lord and Savior, the second person of the triune and only God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in him, the Lord of the universe stepped into his own creation. And he did so to bring us back to him, to bring us into him by his spirit. He lived a perfect life, but he laid that life down on the cross to be a substitute for the judgment we deserve as sinners. And he did so that we might be accepted in him, that by faith in him, he would receive our judgment and we would receive the righteousness of his perfect life, and that we would be accepted by our God and known as his child forever. And it's all by trusting and knowing him. Trust Christ and know all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Everything there is that God has revealed for us to know is found in Christ. Trust him. Put your life in his hands. Rely upon him and come to the knowledge of all that God has for us. All the forgiveness and all the joy and all the hope that is found in our Lord. And beloved Christians, it's important for us to remember and be reminded constantly that Christ is why we're here. That's what we're for. Do your friends and family know that? Do your coworkers and neighbors know that? Or has something else come to their mind when they think of you? Maybe some social concern, some political hobby horse, or just 
a hobby or a sports team. Paul says the main thing that I am here to write and teach you about is that you would know Christ. Is that what people say about us, about you? That your main desire is for them to know Christ. Christian, our main goal and desire is that others know Christ. That's why we're here. That's our ultimate desire for ourselves and for everyone else, is to introduce them to Christ. It's not to rescue our nation. It's not to see whatever other concern we have come to pass, because if those things come to pass and people don't know Christ, it is of no ultimate eternal value. Our main mission, our main goal, is that others know Christ. That's why we're here. That's why Paul wrote, we receive his word as intended for us to grow and know Christ. Thirdly, and finally, in verses 4 and 5, we receive the word of the apostles as required for our discernment, necessary for us to be discerning. If we are to seek all of God's knowledge in Christ, that means, verse 4, not falling for those who tell us otherwise. For the first time, Paul now explains why he's giving this. He says, I say this, verse 4, to protect you from those who would delude you with plausible arguments. And that's the very first reference Paul makes to false teachings and teachers that's going to preoccupy all of chapter 2. He wants the Colossians and us not to be deceived by plausible arguments. And we should understand that phrase, plausible, as fine-sounding. You could maybe even paraphrase that as fancy talk, well-crafted arguments. The idea is something that just sounds good like he'll say in chapter 2, verse 23, that these practices have an appearance of wisdom. What he's talking about here is listening to something that just seems plausible. It sounds really good. Paul's concern that impressive or dramatic or fine-sounding speech will draw them away from the wisdom that's only found in Christ and revealed in him. What came to mind for me was the radical shift our culture has seen in the last decade on so-called gay marriage. Sometimes Christian asks and will ask me, well, well, how do we respond to the arguments for gay marriage? And I usually chuckle. Well, I don't remember having an argument. When were there, was there an argument? There's been no merit set forth. There's been no debate that's taken place. There's been no arguments. We didn't have any cultural or political conversation and realize, no, this is the most logical, rational, consistent way to go, what happens? People were watching Will and Grace. And then they heard some slogans with love in it and said, yeah, that seems plausible. Let's do that. It's not unlike the popularity of false teachers, whether Joel Osteen or Joyce Meyer or Andy Stanley. Tens of thousands of people don't follow them because they set themselves to a serious study and weighing of the facts, they just listened and they liked what they heard, and so it seemed good. Yeah, let's go with that. That's what Paul's warning against, about being taken in by something that just sounds good, being thoughtlessly taken in by a style or emotional persuasion that you neglect the wisdom and knowledge that's only found in whom? Verse 3, in Christ. He said, I'm saying this so that you're not just taken in by things that sound good. I recently finished Marilyn Robinson's novel, Gilead, and it's a fictional journal set in the 1950s of a pastor who is dying of a heart condition, and he's reflecting on his life and ministry. And at one point, the pastor reflects on the growth of media in his, during his ministry, and he says this, you can spend 40 years teaching people to be awake to the fact of mystery, and then some fellow with no more theological sense than a jackrabbit gets himself a radio program and all your work is forgotten. I do wonder where it will end. Of course, we know where it continues in a day, not just a radio, but video and social media and endless marketing and promotion. And the sad truth is, is that we have many theologically and biblically incompetent teachers with no more theological sense than a jackrabbit who have tremendous influence over thousands of people. Why? 
because they look and sound good on live stream. That's it. Just seems plausible. It just makes sense if you don't think about it. And so Paul warns, that's why you need to know Christ. That's why you need to not just know him, but verse 2, you need to have the full assurance of understanding. You need to know that you know who he is so that you're not taken in by just what sounds good, by what seems plausible. That's why we have this word from Christ's apostle. That's why he's writing, so that we have discernment and that we can recognize when something sounds good, but we know it's false because we know Christ and we know what he said. And now, here in verse 5, Paul explains why he can give such a warning. He's Christ's witness. He's his apostle, who he says in verse 5 is with you in spirit. Now, that's not just a nice phrase like, my thoughts and prayers are with you. I'm I'm behind you all the way. He's saying, no, by, by my union with Christ through the Spirit, my authority as an apostle is with you. Where is Paul with us? This letter. His word. His apostolic presence comes through the Spirit of God, through the word the Spirit inspires. He's come through this very letter. He's come and he's present in this writing. Paul's spirit is taken up with the Spirit and he's with him. And he's writing this saying before he begins the commands and warnings that his spiritual authority extends through this writing, even beyond his physical presence. Even though Paul is now locked up in Rome, He's with them as an apostle, by the Spirit, and with this letter. And with that in mind, look at the end of verse 5, and look at what Paul does with his authority. He affirms the Colossians, that they're basically sound. They have good order. Their lives as a church are are well-ordered. They're living as they should. They're living as they ought to as a church and as Christians. And their faith, he says, the firmness of your faith in Christ. Their faith is strong. They're grasping Christ. That means that we should read the warning of verse 4 and the warnings that to come, not as a medication for someone who's already sick, but as a vaccination against the spiritual germs and viruses that swirl around them, the dangers there are lurking. So Paul writes this then as a warning. He writes this because being a Christian is like riding a bike. If you don't keep going forward, you fall off. And so he wants them to keep riding, keep moving forward in view of the dangers and the spiritual error and the false things that are being said all around them. I imagine many of us are aware of the need to be protected against error, especially error about God and about Christ. But we might miss how we can protect ourselves and protect others. It's more than just warning about what is wrong. It's also affirming what's true and affirming when the truth is present. You see, the Colossians are helped to be guarded against error and against what's plausible when they themselves recognize what Christ has done among them. They have good order. They are firm in in their faith in him. We will be guarding against error if we recognize the fruit of truth in our lives. That's really the basis of the ministry of affirmation and encouragement to one another in the church. Speaking out what Christ has done in our lives. It's because those who are discouraged, those who are defeated, those are the ones who are more likely to wander after someone who's saying something that just sounds good. Those who wander away. That's the place of encouragement and the place of affirmation in your ministry to other Christians to help protect one another, to help guard one another. When we tell our brother or our sister, I see God's grace in your life in this way. You know, I I saw this. I've been encouraged to see how you've grown like this. Look at how the Spirit of God has produced this fruit in your life. I'm so thankful to how God has helped you to do this faithfully and according to his word. Those things are not unnecessary. Those kind of encouragements and reminders and affirmations, those things are necessary so that we're aware of the fruit of his grace and protected against the lies of what's just plausible. We'll be more zealous for the truth and more holding firm to Christ when we see and recognize what he has done in our lives. 
And that recognition is more likely to come from someone else who sees what he is doing in our lives to protect one another against error. His letter is required for our discernment, but that doesn't just mean warning us what's wrong. That does mean that. But it also means affirming what's right and affirming when the Spirit of grace is producing His fruit in the lives of His people. It was an offhand remark, but it was quite revealing, at least I thought. The pastor said, I want my people to do what Jesus said, not to sit around and think about something Paul wrote. I stood back to wait for the lightning to strike. It never came. But sadly, like so many, he missed the point entirely of why the apostles wrote. We have these instructions, these corrections, written for us. They've even come to us through the pain and suffering of untold struggles so that we would grow in Christ, that we would know Him, that we would be convinced that we know Him, and that we would be protected from anyone who would lead us astray from Him. The thing about this book is the whole thing is written in red. It's all about knowing Christ, even the letter of the Colossians. Let's pray. Father, we pray that we would know your Son, know you as you revealed yourself through him. We pray that Christ would be glorified, that even as we have sung, not just some, but all glory would be to Christ. We pray that we would grow to know and appreciate how you have revealed yourself to us through your word. And we thank you for the suffering of our brother Paul and for the others who, on the pain of their lives, have brought us your word, even as it comes down to us through the ages of church history, that we might know you. Father, we pray that we would grow in knowing your Son, and we pray we'd be especially warned against any dangers and plausible arguments that still swirl around us. Make us discerning, because we know the true Jesus. And we pray he would be truly witnessed and revealed even in our own lives that those around us who are victims of the evil one, deluded by error, that they would recognize truth and they would come to a saving knowledge of your son and belong to you. We pray that for everyone this morning, Father, that they might be your children by faith in your son and know all the treasure and riches you have for us in him. And may we rejoice in the joy and the privilege of knowing you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.